couple things to get out of the way first. Last time I wore this jacket, somebody asked me if I had won the Masters. Um, I told them I did not. Instead, I thought that it went with my bright and bubbly personality. And so I thought that uh, it would be a nice summer addition to my wardrobe. Uh, Secondly, um, I did want to make a note because I've had multiple conversations about this this week. Uh, I pronounce it Dina, and I don't want that to throw you off. Uh, I took one semester Hebrew and I got a D in it, so it's probably wrong, but it's how I have always said her name. So that's how I'll be saying it. If I say any other names in a a way that sounds weird to you, just be patient with me. It's because I got a D in Hebrew, uh, not because I am somehow smarter than you. Um, And then last, as I always say whenever I get the chance to preach, uh, I am thrilled to be able to open God's word with you this morning. Um, I was reminded of this, of the weight of what we do on Sunday mornings uh, earlier this week as I went to an ordination service for a friend. Um, and just the fact that we get to gather together and open up uh, the word of God and plumb the depths of what message he gave to us years ago uh, and drink deeply from the well of scripture is uh, a joy. What we do in this time together is special and I am grateful for it. Um, I also do want to offer a disclaimer that if the reading of scripture didn't clue you in. Uh, this text does deal with heavy topics, um, things like the rape of a woman by a figure of authority and the murder of several men after they trick them by invoking a religious right. Uh, and so uh, just want grace from you as I preach this passage. Um, I was thinking through it that there are lots of times that I feel uh, too stupid or unintelligent to preach a text of scripture. But this is one of those rare times where I feel not just intellectually uh, unequipped to preach, but also emotionally. Um, My aim this morning is to accurately show you the truth of this story, including the difficult cultural norms that we encounter, but I want to do so with tact and grace to the best of my ability, and without dismissing the weight of sin, show you how Christ writes all and lifts up the humble. So with that behind us, let's pray, and then we will jump right into the text together. Uh, Pray with me, please. Uh, God, um, we come before you now hoping that you will reveal your truth to us. We pray that your goodness is demonstrated even in passages like like these. These passages where sin is especially heavy, where it feels like there is no right solution or right turns And I pray that you would allow me to speak with precision and with gentleness as we navigate this tricky text. I pray that the Spirit would work to reveal your gospel uh, to any here who may not know you, uh, and that for those who do know you, that they may more deeply grow in the love and knowledge of you and your character and your gospel. It is in your Son's name I pray, amen. So we have been going through the book of Genesis for what feels like an eternity now. We've seen a lot of stuff in that time, and yet I think this passage might be one of the harder ones to put in its proper context. What we have seen so far, just to recap, I know we jumped back into Genesis several weeks ago now, um, but we started it so long ago that I don't want to miss the forest for the trees. So to recap, what we have really seen is God forming his people, right? Right? We see uh, he promised to make Abraham into a great nation and that God has been working in and through his lineage to try to preserve the promised seed that would someday save the world. Except they have gotten in their own way at nearly every possible step. This morning we are looking at the beginning of the end of one of Genesis' uh, subplots, the transformation of Jacob. If you'll remember, several chapters ago, we saw Jacob steal his brother's birthright and flee to Bethel to avoid his angry brother. And there, we saw the beginning of Jacob's transformation story. He had a dream of angels ascending and descending a ladder from the ground to the heavens. And he's given a reiteration of that same promise given to Abraham. Your offspring will be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out toward the west, the east, the north, and the south. All the peoples of the earth will be blessed through you and your offspring. Since then, he has fathered 12 sons with three women, has been cheated by his father-in-law, he wrestled with an angel, and then he has sought reconciliation with his brother. And for all these troubles that mark Jacob's story, 
I think chapter 34 might be a low point for him. As we will see, it is a really dark chapter. Let's look together uh, just in the first seven verses. Uh, I will reread those here. And we'll kind of break it down into sort of some digestible text and then try to figure out what uh, this story could possibly reveal about the gospel uh, and could apply to us. Beginning in verse 1. Leah's daughter Dina, whom Leah bore to Jacob, went out to see some of the young women of the area. When Shechem, son of Hamar the Hivite, who was the region's chieftain, saw her, he took her and raped her. He became infatuated with Jacob's daughter Dina. He loved the young girl and spoke tenderly to her. Get me this girl as a wife, he told his father. Jacob heard Shechem had defiled his daughter Dina, but since his sons were with his livestock in the field, he remained silent until they returned. Meanwhile, Shechem's father Hamar came to speak with Jacob. Jacob's sons returned from the field when they heard about the incident. They were deeply grieved and very angry. For Shechem had committed an outrage against Israel by raping Jacob's daughter, and such a thing should not be done. Now, if you'll remember, Jacob wanted to marry Rachel, but he was deceived into marrying Leah. He didn't love Leah, and this is important for today's story because almost all of Jacob's family members that are involved in the story today are children of Leah. Moses reminds us of this right at the beginning of the chapter. Dina, who lies at the very center of the story, is referred to as the daughter of Leah, the one Jacob didn't love. The text tells us that Dina goes to see some of the young women of the area. Mingling with the outside culture, Dina is put in a vulnerable position to be taken advantage of, and it's exactly what happens. Shechem, the son of Hamar, sees Dina, takes Dina, and rapes Dina. Now, this should be a familiar pattern to us by now, and it's one that indicates something terrible is happening. In Genesis 3, Eve sees the fruit of the tree, takes it, and she eats it. In Genesis 6, the sons of God see the daughters of mankind, take them, and bears children with them. In Genesis 16, Sarai sees Hagar, takes her, and gives her over to Abram to try to speed up the promise of the covenant. This is a pattern that's a warning signal for us reading the text that a significant sin is taking place, an egregious sin against God's people. Now, it is worth mentioning that scholars do debate to what degree Dina's violation would have been considered rape in its day. At the very least, an argument could be made that it was primarily a political act. It was a forcible marriage transaction which robbed Dina of her virginal status, something that would have rendered her legally and socially shameful and thus less valuable to the clans inhabiting the land. I'm not fully convinced of that reading. Um, I tend to see this episode in a much more predatory light. Uh, And here's why. Whenever we remember what we've already seen in Genesis, this pattern of seeing and taking, It tends to be a segue not merely to sin, but to heinous sin. And whenever we consider the intense reaction her brothers have, it's hard to believe that it's merely a political move. And once again, it seems likely that in verse 2, Moses is trying to build these actions in intensity. I think it's probably right to read the passage the way that the Christian Standard Bible translates it, which says that, The prince of the land sees Dina, seizes Dina, and then rapes Dina. Having taken her by force, Shechem decides he would now like to take her as a wife. Now, the reason so many people question kind of the status of this violation is because this was a common practice in the ancient world. Men would sometimes try to coerce families into marriage agreements or relationships by violating daughters. And while this is later outlawed in Deuteronomy 22, at this point in history, there's a lot of ambiguity and there's no real legal sense of justice for such a terrible act. We see two reactions in the passage. Jacob remains silent while his sons are deeply grieved and angry. Let's continue reading and see how the story unfolds, beginning in verse 8. 
Hamar said to Jacob's sons, my son Shechem has his heart set on your daughter. Please give her to him as a wife. Intermarry with us. Give your daughters to us and take our daughters for yourselves. Live with us. The land is before you. Settle here, move about, and acquire property in it. Then Shechem said to Dina's father and brothers, grant me favor. Grant me this favor, and I'll give you whatever you say. Demand of me a high compensation and gift. I'll give you whatever you ask me. Just give the girl to be my wife. But Jacob's sons answered Shechem and his father Hamar deceitfully, because he had defiled their sister Dina. We cannot do this thing, they said to him. Giving our sister to an uncircumcised man is a disgrace to us. We will agree with you only on this condition, if all your males are circumcised as we are. Then we will give you our daughters, take your daughters for ourselves, live with you, and become one people. But if you will not listen to us and be circumcised, then we will take our daughter and go. The solution proposed from Hamar is simple. The two families can intermarry, and live as one people. If Jacob's sons would be willing to assimilate with Hamar's, then they would be able to live peaceably. They'd be able to acquire property together. And it's important to note the ways this is both similar and dissimilar to what we have already seen in Genesis. For starters, the family history of mingling with outsiders doesn't have a good track record. If you'll remember, Lot got too close with the people of Sodom, and it led to disaster. The end of Genesis 26 says that intermarrying with the surrounding peoples made life bitter for Isaac and Rebekah. And up to this point, it's the fact that Dina got too close with the people in the surrounding cultures that led her to being seen, taken, and had against her will. This is an idea that's especially important in the ancient Near East because it had significant ramifications for social power and possessions. In fact, that's the very heart of the motives later in the story. There's something else that should raise some suspicion about what's going on. And that is the way that so far, the episodes of intermarriage that we have seen in the book of Genesis, they tend to involve a son from the promise line taking a wife from outside of God's people, not the other way around. Take, for example, the marriage that I mentioned in chapter 26 where Esau takes Judith and Basemeth as both, uh, both as wives, and they're both Hethites. This forces Isaac to warn Jacob against marrying a Canaanite girl, which begins his journey to Laban to marry Rachel and Leah. In the story of Shechem and Dina, however, the roles are reversed, and the direction of this relationship is changed. Dina, the daughter of Jacob, is being asked to take a husband from outside the clan. This could explain, for example, why circumcision is such an important point for Dina's brothers. It would serve as some kind of justification or legitimize the marriage to the family. Of course, we know they didn't have pure intentions when making this concession. In their minds, they were plotting revenge. However, to Hamar and Shechem, the condition of circumcision would have actually made a lot of sense in their context. Now, I say all this because I know the difference between marrying an outsider wife versus an outsider husband seems small to us today. But in the ancient world, the two couldn't have been more different. And the importance of this is underscored by Hamar and Shechem's reaction. Look again in the text as we continue in verse 18. Their words seemed good to Hamar and his son Shechem. The young man did not delay doing this because he was delighted with Jacob's daughter. Now, he was the most important man He was the most important in all his father's family. So Hamar and his son Shechem went to the gate of their city and spoke to the men of their city. These men are peaceful towards us, they said. Let them live in our land and move about in it, for indeed the region is large enough for them. Let's take their daughters as our wives and give our daughters to them. But the men will agree to live with us and be one people only on this condition, if all our men are circumcised as they are. Won't their livestock, their possessions, and all their animals become ours? Only let's agree with them, and they will live with us. Hamar and Shechem return to the city and tell the men about this marriage arrangement. And from their perspective, like we've seen, it's sort of a no-brainer. If the men will agree to be circumcised, then their their possessions will immensely increase. 
because they will be taking the family's daughter. They'll possess their livestock, their property, their animals. And this just goes to show that even though the text says Shechem loved Dina, his desire and love for Dina was one of questionable adoration or care. It was a power grab. There's something going on beneath the surface of this story. It's not merely a defiling of Dina, but a defiling of God's people. His faithful promise line is trying to be deceived into intermarrying with outsiders. Continuing on, it says that all the men who had come to the city gates listened to Hamar and his son Shechem, and all those men were circumcised. On the third day, when they were still in pain, two of Jacob's sons, Simeon and Levi, Dina's brothers, took their swords, went into the unsuspecting city, and they killed every male. They killed Hamar and his son Shechem with their swords, took Dina from Shechem's house, and went away. Jacob's sons came to the slaughter and plundered the city because their sister had been defiled. They took their flocks, herds, donkeys, and whatever was in the city and in the field. They captured all their possessions, dependents, and wives, and plundered everything in the houses. Then Jacob said to Simeon and Levi, You have brought trouble on me, making me odious to the inhabitants of the land, the Canaanites and the Perizzites. We are few in number. If they unite against me and attack me, I and my household will be destroyed. But they answered, Should he treat our sister like a prostitute? So as it turns out, circumcision agreement had been a trick. Simeon and Levi are trying to get revenge for the offense committed against their sister. And in a moment when every man would be in weakness and recovery, Simeon and Levi enter the city, kill every male, rescue their captive sister, and plunder everything as they leave the city. In response to Simeon and Levi's revenge, Jacob doesn't even acknowledge what his sons have done by rescuing their sister. Instead, he immediately cares about his own reputation. You have brought trouble on me, making me odious to the inhabitants of the land. And even more puzzling, this feeling of outrage doesn't seem to go away with time. As we will see in his last words in Genesis 49, he curses Simeon and Levi. So Simeon and Levi are brothers. Their knives are vicious weapons. May I never enter their council. May I never join their assembly. For in their anger they kill men, and on a whim they hamstring oxen. Their anger is cursed, for it is strong, and their fury, for it is cruel. I will disperse them throughout Jacob and scatter them throughout Israel. Now this curse will eventually have some lasting effects on the nation of Israel, but they aren't immediately obvious to us in the story. It's not like some of these other things we have seen in the book of Genesis, where you know something terrible happens and it immediately drives them into another land, and because of that, some significant event happens in this land that they needed to be there. The story just ends. Jacob's frustrated and Simeon and Levi try to justify themselves and the chapter moves on to talk about leaving for Bethel. So what are we to make of all this? Here we are some, I don't know, 15, 20 minutes into studying the passage together and we get to the end and Moses leaves us hanging. Jacob is angry with his sons and his sons are defensive of their sister. If we zoom in and just look at chapter 34 on its own terms, I think there are a few themes that we can actually look at and pull out, especially once we notice some of the unique literary characteristics of this story. What I'm trying to get at is this. Whenever we read the Bible, we often need to ask why the author, especially in the Old Testament, included specific details, why they wrote in the style they did, what stands out about the argument and arrangement of the narrative. Literary roles are distinctive features of biblical text, and it often tells us subtle truths that we may have missed if we read too quickly. So I put these in in the outline in the bulletin, but there are three ways I think we need to read this story in light of the work of Jesus and see this fulfilled through the gospel. The first pertains to what I have called Jesus and the problem of identity. From the onset of the chapter, if you'll notice, Dina's identity is almost always found in her relationship to others. She's always called her mother's daughter, or her father's daughter, or her brother's sister. In fact, you'll notice that Dina is identified as Jacob's daughter at the beginning of the chapter, but then as the story progresses and her brothers begin to defend her, her identity shifts to being associated with her brothers, 
Something that many have taken as Moses trying to attribute a kind of negative light to Jacob's actions throughout the story. To me, it's maybe the most obvious thing about this story. Dina's never given her own identity, her own, her own personality or personhood. In fact, Dina never utters a single word in all of chapter 34. Think about how she is used in this story. She's used by Shechem physically. She's used as a pawn in a political and marital game as a result of this. And she's used by her brothers as justification to commit mass murder. She's arguably the most central character in the plot line of chapter 34. And yet she's not even treated like a protagonist if we were to look at it as a literary work. She's treated instead like a side character, always off camera but always talked about. Whereas Dina could once be known as the daughter of Jacob, because of his cowardice and inability to defend his honor, she is better now known as her brother's sister. And her silence rings loudly in Genesis 34 because it's how the author reflects what has happened to her. By virtue of being forcibly robbed of her virginity, Dina has been stripped of her personhood. And this confronts us with an important truth, that through the gospel, our identities are renewed. At the beginning where it calls, uh, I forget how it says it, but it says uh, Shechem is the son of Hamar, and the prince of the land is kind of how it's literally rendered there. And like Dina, we have been ensnared by the prince of the land, the one who prowls looking for someone to devour. And apart from Christ, we are without our own identities and slaves to sin. The promise of Christ in John 12 says that the ruler of this world, aka the prince of the land, will be cast out as Jesus is lifted up from the earth, because he will draw all people to himself. John 1 tells us that all who receive him and believe in him are actually given the right to become children of God. And later, in John 15, John shows us that this identity shift looks like by doing the same thing we see in Genesis 34, identifying us by our relationship to him. I do not call you servants anymore, Jesus says, because a servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends because I have made made known to you everything I have heard from my father. Perhaps you are in the midst of an identity crisis. I am in my mid-twenties, so I can tell you what it feels like to be having an identity crisis, okay? I'm with you. But maybe someone else has made your life miserable for one reason or another. Maybe you have wrecked your own life and you find yourself captive to sin. Maybe you're like Jacob, just trying to get to the finish line of wherever you feel like God is calling you, but you find yourself stopping short in disobedience and you don't know why. I'm here today to tell you that you don't have to allow what happens to you in this life to define your identity no matter how tragic or how successful those things may be. God has given you a better way, and it is made known in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus took on the human form. He took on our identity so that in doing so, we could take on the likeness of him and bear God's name. As the story of Dina shows us, your identity in this world doesn't matter, and it won't save you because it can't save you. Instead, your identity in relation to Christ saves you. Believe in him. Trust in him. So, moving on from this problem of identity, the next thing that I think we see in this text is how the gospel fulfills and offers the protection of women. It's something that I feel like I can't help but to address given the subject matter of Genesis 34. But it's clear throughout all of Genesis, and especially in this chapter, that God's people have a responsibility to care for the humble. And the Bible expresses this specifically through the call to protect vulnerable women. In fact, I think when we look closely at the role of women in these Old Testament passages, we see that they are turned on their heads during the ministry of Jesus. It reorients the way that we perceive these differences that exist between man and woman. 
We'll start with the text we've looked at today. One would think that Jacob would be proud of his sons for defending his sister's honor, right? But we see quite the opposite. This is once again a recurring pattern in Genesis. The patriarch's desire for social status at the expense of protecting women causes them trouble. Remember when Abraham lied about Sarah being his sister? He endangered Sarah because he didn't trust that God would sustain him in the midst of the surrounding culture. The same thing happens to Isaac in Genesis 26. He lies about his wife being his sister so that he can stay in the good graces of the men in the land. And then, of course, today, Dina is forcibly taken into the prince's home because Jacob hopes to keep good favor with those around him. All three of the patriarchs endanger the lives and minimize the identities of the women around them, and all three times it results in terrible things happening to them. Abraham and Isaac actually end up angering the people that they were trying to please. Their reputations are ruined, their sufferings are increased, and their toil is amplified. And I just don't think it's a coincidence that three of the most significant figures we see in the book of Genesis have this happen to them. Instead, I think it's trying to prove a point. Contrast this to what we see whenever we get to the New Testament. Jesus' interactions with women are characterized by the complete opposite tone than that. We see Jesus talking to a Samaritan woman at midday, beckoning her to repentance. We see Jesus express patience in the midst of the crowd as a woman with a discharge touches his tunic. He doesn't scold her. He sees her tells her that her faith has healed her, and then tells her to go away respectfully. Dina's social status may have been taken from her because she was no longer a virgin, but Jesus is the one who the scriptures call a friend of sinners and prostitutes. Dina may not have been allowed to say a single word about what happened to her, but when the resurrection happens, it's women who are the first to deliver the good news to the rest of Jesus' disciples. Luke 24 tells us that it's Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and other unnamed women who told the apostles what they saw. He is not here, but he has risen. Now, I'm sure that this may sound a little like reading into the text for some of you, but I don't think there's denying what the biblical evidence shows us, that God wants his people to love the humble, and culturally, in the scriptures, this is communicated through women. Now, I want to just take a moment and reflect on this. Uh, Chandler brought it up earlier, but we didn't plan for this sermon series to overlap with the uh, Southern Baptist Convention's annual meeting. It just happened this way. And for those of you who uh, are aware of what's been going on in the SVC recently, does Genesis 34 not feel like a story we need to hear? At our annual meeting this year, something important got decided. The SBC voted to accept recommendations put forward by a specially appointed task force that had been investigating the mishandling of sex abuse. In the last few years, there have been hundreds of instances of sex abuse brought to light in the SBC, and it was found that several powerful players in our denomination chose to sit in silence, just like Jacob, whenever they found out about it. Now, I thank God that the vast majority of Baptists, probably something like 90% of the messengers at the SBC, voted to approve these recommendations. And I do believe there are better days ahead for the convention. If I didn't, I would leave. However, I'm also grieved to know that there is still a vocal contingency hoping to sweep this stuff under the rug. Like Jacob, they are willing to turn a blind eye to grievous injustices as long as it keeps peace with the culture around them and it doesn't cost us too much money. They don't share the same concern as Christ for the brokenhearted and the weary. Many of them care instead about their own advancement. So friends, if if you take me seriously at all this morning, let me challenge you to never let this be at First Baptist Alcoa. I pray to God that we reflect the attitude of Jesus in our church culture, that we don't just enable women to serve and participate in the life of the church, but we actually create a church environment where women and children feel safe because Jesus makes them safe. The God of the Bible is a God who wants his people to protect vulnerable people, 
We see it in the Old Testament time and time again. God stores up wrath against those who fail to care for those God cares for. The role of Dina, among other women depicted in Genesis, reminds us that bad things happen to God's people when they ignore the marginalized and the forgotten that surround them. So, we've seen that Jesus, in the gospel, reveals our true identities and how he beckons us to protect the vulnerable. And the last thing I think that we see in this passage is what I've called the potential of grace. We could probably characterize the book of Genesis like so. God is gracious in spite of our sin. Like we've seen so often, our story today ends on a sour note. Once again, it feels like the promise has failed. I don't know if you realize this as we studied the story together, but Genesis 34 actually never even mentions God. Unlike many of the difficult passages that we've looked at in Genesis, usually there's some kind of semblance of hope. There's a a reference to the promised seed. There is a, a recollection of what Abraham was told. But here, there's not even a glimmer of the promised seed. There's no restating of God's promise. There's no expectation that God's going to redeem Dina's circumstances or bring justice to Simeon and Levi for murder. It doesn't even seem like he really reprimands Jacob. And still, we know the rest of the story. God does redeem them. The promise line does continue. God continues forming Israel into a people, and he entrusts them with the law. And he doesn't just stop there. He sends his son to redeem not just Israel, but the whole world. Jesus comes to fulfill the failings of the patriarchs, and in doing so, brings us into the presence of God. Uh, Turn with me to to Galatians chapter 3. Verse 19, and then we'll skip ahead to 24. Uh, Let's see here. Why then was the law given? It was added for the sake of transgressions until the seed to whom the promise was made would come. The law was put into effect through angels by means of a mediator. The law then was our guardian until Christ, so that we could be justified by faith. But since that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For through faith you are all sons of God in Christ Jesus. For those of you who were baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is no Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female, since you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed, heirs according to the promise. The promises that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob failed to obtain in light of their failures are granted to us. Because Christ is the promised seed. And we have been brought into participation in him. The fruits that Abraham and Isaac and Jacob sought are not lost because they failed to obtain them. They are given to us through the work of Christ on the cross and our incorporation into him. The story of Dina, her brothers, and Jacob is a reminder that apart from Christ, there is no saving work. That left to our own devices, we will fail. We can't earn our way to God. And in fact, whenever we are given chances to be obedient, we are really bad at it. Genesis shows us this. Finding worldly favor leads us to sin. Getting vengeance leads to calamity. Failing to protect those God protects brings about judgment. What are we to do other than turn to the grace of God? of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Bearing the form of humanity and taking the weight of sin's punishment on the cross, grace is made possible through Christ. Trust in him who is truly Abraham's seed, the one who saves. Now I'm convinced that every one of us uh, lives a life that looks similar to one of the characters in this story. I'm sure that, you know, Maybe it's not as intense, right? Maybe you're like Hamar and Shechem and you haven't done quite as heinous things of them, but you take advantage of people in some other way. Maybe you lack integrity in the workplace or you aren't completely honest about your financials or you emotionally manipulate people sometimes on accident. Maybe you relate to Dina. You feel like your voice has been stripped from you. 
Like you don't have a say in your own story. Like everyone else has taken away your humanity. Maybe you're plotting to act on some kind of anger or you're waiting in passivity like we see Dina's family members. Whatever you may find yourself, let me encourage you with this. That Jesus is the one who restores our identity, not your actions. That Jesus holds the broken and the vulnerable close to his heart. And that Jesus makes grace possible for each of us. Genesis 34 shows us that sin utterly disorders our lives until it is removed by Christ, who restores all things to their proper order. Now, if you aren't a believer, um, our elders, we have several of them in the room, uh, they would love to talk to you about the offer of the gospel that can be found in Christ's life, death, and resurrection. I would encourage you uh, to find one of them after the service if you need to have further conversation about uh, the wonderful gospel who redeems all things, even whenever it seems like all hope is lost. Let's pray together, and then I think Brandy and Joy will come up and close us.